Good morning uh, or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jason Buffington with Veeam. My esteemed colleague Dave Russell has the week off. So instead, we got an upgrade uh, in the form of Dustin Albertson. Uh, Dustin, thank you for joining me this morning. Hey, no problem. Happy to be here. Dustin, give us 30 seconds on on uh, I have advertised about you all week. Looking forward to this. Uh, you are a cloudy human. Tell us what that means. Sure, no problem. So I am the manager of cloud and applications for product management alliances at Veeam. Um, what that means is I control and run all the uh, cloud alliances from a relationship standpoint. But prior to that, uh, I was the VCSP SA. I've worked for cloud providers. I've worked for service providers. Long story short, I'm a cloudy person. It goes, it goes deep. Awesome. A cloudy human. Um, so <laughs> what I thought we'd do, uh, and by the way, Justin, where are you, uh, where are you calling in from this morning? Yes, so I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. South Carolina. You do have a little bit of that Southern gentleman twang uh, <laughs> coming do, from behind. Uh, and, uh, and we do want to find out where everyone else is coming from as well. So I am from the great state of Texas. We have South Carolina in the house. We've got uh, Georgia, um, uh, our producer, Mark. Uh, um, we've got, let's see. Uh, well, light up the map. Tell us where you're from uh, along the way. All right, so with that, uh, let's get right into this. And while people are first chiming in on the map, we want to um, uh, talk about the moving landscape, if you will, of cloud. I want to go ahead and bring up slide number one. And this is the, we actually brought up a couple slides that Dave and I used at the very beginning of the year, but but both of us just pretend to be cloudy humans. So now that we have a real cloudy human, I want to get some re new responses on this. So this first chart, um, this is from uh, Veeam's uh, massive data protection trends report. This last year, we had uh, 3,000 respondents overall that surveyed for that. And, and, uh, and for those who haven't seen this particular chart before, it's one of my favorites. We asked in 2020, that's the darkest green on the left-hand side, we asked organizations what percentage of their servers were physical in the left-hand side versus virtual in the middle of the screen versus cloud-hosted on the right-hand side. So as a snapshot, pun intended, 38% of servers were physical, 30% in the middle uh, left were virtual, and 32% were cloud-hosted, either hyperscale or on a regional service provider. Now, in 2020, we also asked folks, what do you think it's going to be two years later? which is that yellowy green. And so you see, you kind of skip one um, to see the 2022 anticipated data. Well, that was a year and a half ago. Um, earlier this year, the DPR 21 data also asked the question, that's that darkest green, 29% on the left-hand side. And then what they thought it was going to be two years later, which is the tealish of the four at 24. So I think it tells three really interesting stories. Let me unpack this really quick, and then Dustin, I want to I want to hear from your thoughts because you have several different cloud perspectives. Let's look at this. So basically, what people thought their physical servers were going to look like was about thirty eight percent, and over the next two years, they thought it would get down the yellowy part, which is twenty nine. But we know COVID, quarantine. You couldn't get in the data center, right? So for all those reasons, a lot of cloud IT modernization issues accelerated. What they thought they were going to get in two years, they actually got in one. They got that 29% in the darkish green um, in the uh, in in year one, and they think it's going to go even further down, down to about 24%. Um, so basically, it's a it's a it's a gradual decline of the percentage of of servers that are physical. Virtual tells a little bit different story. Basically, you can see there's two pairings that are flat, right? That it was at 30, they thought it was going to stay at 30. No, no, it's actually at 23, but they think it's going to go to 24, so roughly flat. And then those net sum gains on the right hand side, um, they thought it was going to be 32 going towards 41. Actually, we're at 47 and we're going to 52. And I love that last nugget because going from 47 to 52 means it's a majority. Right, you're crossing that 50% mark, thinking that more than half of your servers are going to be cloud hosted. Now we've got a little bit of data to share where that is otherwise, but that gradual movement, uh, and and I don't think anyone at Veeam is saying the data center is dead, all brick and mortar raised floor is going to go away. But but Dustin, from your perspectives as both a service provider history as well as what you do when you're partnering with our friends at Amazon and Azure and others, what's your reaction to this? Um, and what should people be thinking about as they're thinking about what workload should land where? 
Okay, so my first reaction is that that I love it, right? So from from a cloud perspective, we always talk about you know the cloud is this, cloud is that. It's, it's the most important thing. You know, it's 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 been a hot topic for for it seems like uh, uh, years now, right? So, but w what I mean is, I like this data because it does actually show you know that stuff is happening. This stuff is moving towards the cloud. So this is a um, something that you know I can leverage to to kind of show that that migration. But with that short, I, I think nobody can say that COVID or nobody can deny that that COVID kind of expedited this process. Um, it's made us more important for uh, just the remote aspect of it, the remote workers, home workers. A lot of people who never worked remotely are now working remotely. Right. And it's kind of exacerbated this process, right? That's fair. So, you know, one of the things when I first saw this data that was kind of alarming for me is, does this mean the data center is dying? Right. And I say that with a little bit of hyperbole and 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 uh, and exaggeration. But um, if we could ask the producers, let's go to slide two for just a second. I want to look on the left hand side of, of slide two, because one of the things that actually was kind of heartening for me was it would be easy to look at that first chart and just see physical virtual cloud and think it's a net sum zero gain, meaning that servers were always being migrated. And that's actually not the case. Right. So when we look on that left hand side data. We did ask in the 2021 data, where did your servers come from? Right. It's like, you know, you ask, a, a, you know, um, a mommy and daddy in the cloud, where do cloudy servers come from? And and only about 60 percent were migrated from physical or virtual infrastructure in the data center. The other 40 percent were just stood up. And, I, and in my mind, this kind of validates a cloud first, but not a cloud only strategy does that feel right to you yeah it does i mean it, you know a lot of this is in my mind is is uh modernization right we we've talked about modern modernizing uh it for a while and that's kind of what it is 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 it's a lot easier to develop in the cloud or develop a cloud first strategy moving forward than trying to revamp all this old you know thick thick server fat client uh, Type applications trying to modernize that, right? Sure. So that's that's what I that's what I take from it is is that like you say, a lot of people are, are starting. Hey, from this moment forward, anything new is going to be cloud first. You know, anything old, we'll, we'll let it either age out or we'll update it to be cloud first. Let's let's follow that track for a second, and um, uh, uh, let's bring up slide three. And this one we might actually want to spend some time on because I want you to kind of. Um, uh, from your solutions architect days, you know. So for those that don't know, when when our marquee accounts um, at Veeam or um, you know large enterprises, when they're really looking at deploying Veeam universally, or when there's a complex architecture to be done, that's when we bring in uh, a Veeam solutions architect. And these are uh, uh, maybe not Dustin, but the rest of them are some of the sharpest minds that we have um, with. A, just for fun, um, at, at Veeam to help them understand, you know, there's not always a perfect fit. You know, you're going to use technologies differently. Let's talk about slide number three for a second, because slide three, the, the question was, what are the determinants for when a workload should run cloud host versus on-prem? Now, notice it does not say, the top one is cost. It does not say the cloud is cheaper. Right. Um, the second one down uh, on security does not say the cloud is more secure. This is not a comparison between the two, but this is a, a stack ranking of what are the factors that come into play when choosing whether workloads should be cloud hosted versus on prem. And I'd make the case that every one of these, there's two sides to every coin. I'd really love for you to unpack these for us, Dustin. When someone says, hey, cost is my number one determinant, what are the things that drive costs either side of that consideration? Yeah, good good point. So if, if someone said to me, cost is my number one determinant, I, I'd, I'd probably reply back to them that you're doing it wrong, right? Like, So if you're setting off to the cloud because you think it's going to be cheaper, that's, that's one thing. But the flexibility is usually what, what they mean by cost, right? So I can I can develop an app, I can spin rack things up, I can ramp them down a lot easier and more cost effective in the cloud than I could on prem, where I have to buy the traditional licensing and servers and and all of that. Um, so that's usually what what people are referring to. But I, I would agree that the costing is 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 important, but it shouldn't be the primary reason for 
uh, for setting off a cloud voyage. That's fair. Let's let's go through the list. So we see here the uh, the uh, so dark green is when someone could choose any one of them. And so, you know, using cost as the example for the purposes of the chart, 66 percent. So two uh, two thirds of organizations that were surveyed um, cost was one of their determining factors as to whether it goes in the cloud or not. Um, the the yellowish green, that's when you can only pick one. Um, and for um, uh, for a third of organizations, 34 um, percent cost was the primary driver. So uh, when, when is cloud more expensive and when is cloud less expensive when you're trying to measure that, regardless of where it fits in the, in the stack? Yeah. So cloud is more expensive when you uh, because of that flexibility, but it's more expensive when you try to squeeze an on prem workload into a cloud based design. Um, that's when it gets to be more expensive. And and what I mean by flexibility there is that I can spin up as many instances or services as I need just to test something out. But if I'm not actively uh, checking those, making sure that they're being shut down, um, making sure that you know I have redundancy, you know all these different factors, then it becomes uh, a kind of sprawl issue, mm -hmm. um, and my costing is going to ramp up, you know, dramatically. Okay. I'll give you a second to uh, to look at the other ones in the list. Let's take a look at the map uh, really quick. Um, so let's see. So uh, we've got a pretty good list going so far. So France is in the house. Slovenia is in the house. Uh, India, Kenya. Uh, uh, love that. So over in the U.S., we've got uh, looks like California on the left, Ohio. Always good to see some folks. It's probably some of our friends from uh, from the Columbus office, if I'm honest about it. Uh, let's see where else we got folks. South Africa, you can almost always count out uh, on uh, friends from South Africa joining. So thank you for that. Um, and then Brazil, I, I got to admit, um, it's always a trade up for me. So two of my favorite places, actually three of my favorite places to travel are all on this list. Love South Africa, fantastic meat, fantastic wine. Um, and the safaris aren't bad either. Uh, Brazil, uh, fantastic meat, fantastic wine. There's a trend going there. Uh, Singapore is in the house. Amazing food um, in Singapore as well, um, though they don't really have grapes. So, well, two out of three. Um, but yeah, so please keep the uh, uh, please keep the countries going. I tell you, the one thing I truly miss after 16 months of quarantine, uh, the amazing foods around the world. I cannot wait to get back on a plane and uh, and go spend some uh, spend some time with friends. So, all right. Uh, yeah, please keep piling on and we're going to keep uh, uh, calling out the countries as they go. Let, let's get back to when does one use the cloud? Um, uh, for this next one, actually, let's do this. Let's go to slide four and then we'll come back to this list because I think it's interesting when we looked at slide four. Um, uh, I'm a negative person more than I am a positive in some cases. And so we asked organizations that were using the cloud in production. We asked them, what benefits have you gotten from using public scale cloud um, on the left? And then what were the challenges on the right? Um, and I think it's interesting connectivity and security um, I, I will tell you, Dustin, um, uh, you gave me actually minor credentials and I got to play with a little bit of cloud stuff over the summer. And the first thing I figured out was opening up a workload in a cloud, making it um, uh, accessible meant I had to open up some firewall policies. And yet when I to make it easy, I opened it up too far and actually increased my attack surface. So in my mind, a lot of the connectivity and security issues are um, perhaps linked together more than they should. That was my experience. Tell me about yours, because this is the world you live and breathe in. I, I would agree. Uh, I mean, all of the major hyperscalers, at least, everything is usually denied by default. Um, right. So, so it's usually going to be a, a user error, um, or somebody did something, right? So, uh, you you'll hear these news stories all the time of, of people getting hacked and and you know the cloud provider's fault. It's like. No, not really. It's usually a, a person, you know, had to make a change to make that issue uh, be there. But it, again, it goes back to who's the user that's doing this, right? Because this is a different world, whereas the the person who used to be the VMware admin is now running everything. They're doing networking. They're doing the right. you know, uh, user credentials and everything. So it, it's it's a different world, but it it, it, it presents these. Uh, these capabilities to be able to have these connectivity and performance issues and things like that. 
Yeah, I've been a server and storage guy for 31 years, um, and I never even pretended to be a networking person. And so when someone says, yeah, just open up the firewall so you can get to it, my my presumption is all or nothing. Um, yeah. And uh, and so I, I have I have been guilty of that as well. Um, so with that in mind, let's go back to to slide to slide three. Let's talk about those issues because we talked about cost. There are reasons why the co- the cloud could be more or less expensive. Let's talk about. I think it's interesting that security and compliance are side by side. I think that's interesting. And then arguably ease of management. You could make the case that administrative error is probably the biggest challenge there as opposed to, you know, just managing the cloud. Portals are pretty nice, but administrative configuration, I think, would be a challenge. Talk about when is uh, when should a workload be cloudy or not when it comes to security and compliance stuff? I mean, I, would, I think my take, again, being a cloudy guy, my take is that it, just about anything could be uh, – uh, a cloud-based workload. Um, security and compliance, uh, the reason why a lot of people go to these clouds is because they're so uh, secure by default. Yep. They have all the, the uh, certifications, they have all the, you know, FedRAMP, um, all the, the uh, credential industry certifications, they have all these in place. So um, it's there, it's easy to, I don't want to say it's easy, it's there, it's flexible for you to be able to set it up. Um, if you know what you're doing. And, and that's really the key there is that a lot of people will go into the cloud because it's so easy, um, but they don't have that skill set or they don't have the understanding of if I make this change, what is the impact down the line? And that's usually where you know these issues arise. Double click on that for me for a second. So sure. uh, um, especially it relates to, to compliance, let's talk geo-sovereignty. Um, you know, depending on what part of the world that you come from, in some cases, people say, you know, uh, uh, German data can't leave, you know, the, the the magic dotted line that is Germany, right, um, uh, or French or Australia or, you know, pick a sovereignty area. How does one, and, and this is not an area I'm, I'm familiar with, how does one ensure that data resides within the a, a locality or a sovereignty? Where does that really come into a conversation with cloud? So it, it, it does come into conversation. So it, again, being multinational companies, there's a lot of these times where the the data may need to reside in Germany. Let's, for this example, let's say Germany. Um, but the admins are being done, you know, by uh, SAs or people within the U.S. Right. So they're not familiar with all these German laws and regulations that they have to do. But we'll take all that out of the mix. Let's just say look at it from a cloud perspective. If you want to keep your, your data in Germany, there's regions, there's availability zones, there's uh, data centers located in Germany. You can you can have your S3 buckets located in Germany. So you can try to keep all that data within a, a geographical location. Um, but you can also create uh, rules and, and uh, firewall rules and web access rules that only uh, will restrict that data, but access to that data from within those regions as well. So there are ways to go about uh, you know, keeping it within a physical region or, or location. Got it. Okay, so we've we've spent uh, we're about twenty minutes into our time, and for the most part, we've really just been talking about the production shifts in the cloud and how people need to be thinking about that. Of course, here at Veeam, we're a backup company, right? So let's take a look at slide five. And um, we asked two kind of related questions around this idea. Uh, by the way, one of the things we did in this one, which I thought was a lot of fun, in a different survey instrument, we asked IaaS admins, so those folks that are running this production cloud, and and they're they're the, they're the they are your cloudy peeps, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then we asked traditional backup admins um, the same questions. And two things I thought were really interesting. It used to be, uh, you know, back when, uh, well, back when my beard was not gray and you had hair on top, you know, way, <laughs> way back in the day, there wasn't as much unity between the different IT teams. And you get different people thinking different ways about about things. I was surprised how well IaaS admins and backup admins see the problems and the, the drivers for data protection the same way. Um, two things that come to mind. One, when asking about who's driving the strategy and the requirements for data protection, I was surprised the IT team trumps the data protection team by nearly two to one. That's what the left-hand side says. And yet, on the right-hand side, the people that are actually doing the backups are typically still 
backup e humans. Both sides agree that that's the side doing the backups, even though they aren't the ones defining the strategy for that. Um, talk about, I mean, you've worked with a lot of organizations on both sides of the aisle here. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, first of all, it's kind of interesting, right? But I, I think what it comes down to is that it's it's a it's a culture shift. So when when the traditional backup admin on prem is now is now the IIS admin, right? Because he's in charge of those workloads. He's in charge of of creating them, managing them, making sure that they're being protected. Sure. Um, because it's a cloud based workload. So now he's becoming both the IIS admin and the backup admin um, because somebody has to do it. <laughs> and that data needs to be protected, right? That makes sense. Um, uh, what do you so for the folks on the right then on the on the right hand side, same individuals are protecting the on prem backups versus the cloud backups. We got about seven more minutes left. Put your put your Veeam hat back on. You've been great as an industry person, but put your Veeam hat back on. What do you want to tell those traditional data center backup admins about backing up the cloud? No problem. So, you know, putting my Veeam hat on, not to go into a, a Veeam spill, but I'll, let me first take it from a cloud perspective. So each one of these hyperscalers has a, a uh, well-architected framework, they call it. And, and that's very important to know. Um, and basically what it's doing is, is helping an IaaS admin or helping anybody who leverages those clouds to know the best practices for how to set up things. Typically, it means least valuable access, um, the least amount of privileges that people need. And also one of the big things there is, is setting things up so that they're highly available, redundant, and that data is being protected. Uh, the key point for me, of course, is the data is being protected. Sure. Um, just because something moves into the cloud doesn't mean that it's, it's automatically going to be protected or somebody else is doing that. Um, so that's why I'm seeing the I as admin doing it. And, and that's where products like, like Veeam come into play, where we have uh, backup products for all of these hyperscalers that do protect those workloads natively to how they are, are meant to be protected in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, we're leveraging those best practices. We're going through what's called WARS, well-architected reviews with AWS and, and Microsoft and Google to make sure that we're not only doing the best practice from a data perspective, but yep. also best practice from an API and AW and cloud perspective. Okay. Um, so that's that's you know that's kind of the the gist of it. But again, it's making sure that not only what we're doing is best for the data, but best for the cloud that it's in as well. Got it. Got it. Okay, so um, let's stay on that for a second. Let's bring up slide six. Um, this might be uh, presumably the last one we have time for today. So, so again, um, uh, you've got uh, you've got data from 2020 looking at 2022, intermixed with 2021 looking at 2023. So it gives us these nice three curves. And and I think uh, and uh, you'll have to you, uh, you should answer as both a VCSP SME as well as an Azure and Amazon advocate, because I think you get both stories in this mix. So we asked organizations, you know, what percentage of your day is being protected um, by which kinds of tools and where do you think your primary backups are going to go? And what you see on that left-hand side is the idea of self-managed backup, which of course, you know, Veeam loves that, using all on-prem tools. We see a, you know, a significant, say, decline of that aspiring over that four-year curve on the left. When we look at self-managed backup tools, but using cloud services, so I I read that as cloud tier, cloud connect, but I'm still driving it with say our core flagship BBR product. That's the center, and then over on the right, cloud managed backup with a with a service provider, right? And so, um, uh, and and both of those are obviously going up. What so so is the future of backup cloudy? Because um, that's what the data shows. What should we be thinking about as far as service providers and using cloud services overall? Where does the cloud fit in a data protection strategy? So, I mean, it fits in the two, right? The, the three, two, one, but <laughs> so two different data. But anyway, so where the cloud fits is, is again, it comes to that flexibility um, aspect of, of being able to get that data offsite much more efficiently than you know, writing it to a tape, sending it to a bank vault or, or mountain or cave or wherever. Um, but it is, it's, it's allowing you to do that in a more thorough manner. But the interesting takeaway on the slide for me is, again, the, the backup as a service provider. So um, the VCSPs, the, the MSPs of the world, um, 
those are always going to be around. I mean, MSPs have always been around for for you know since IT was created. But what what this enables is is it's a lot easier for somebody to send you know I'm going to send my backups to a, a MSP, and I also have somebody that I could talk to, somebody who can help me with uh, other projects, help me with things. Whereas a lot of the hyperscale clouds, I can send them data, but yet it's going to be another third party um, that would provide services on top of of those clouds. Whereas you know a, a MSP is going to provide that cloud service themselves. They're going to be a lot more familiar with my environment. They're going to be more familiar with my data. And, and that provides a, another layer uh, of service on top of that, right? So that's uh, that's where that comes into play. I really like what you said there. So a lot of times when we talk about the cloud, right? And there's not really the, um, there's yeah. a big asterisk and italics on that. Um, but really to be, often when we talk about service providers as part of data protection, we focus on the provider aspect that there is a target out there that magically receives the data and how wonderful is that? But I think you and I would agree that honestly, it's the service that actually matters. And I think another word for service in this case is expertise, right? Mm -hmm. And expertise comes in a couple of fashions. If you're talking about an MSP, that is, that is empathy in your environment. They helped you build your environment. They know your data, they know your business. Who better to help you with recovery than that? including protection jobs. And I think also when we look at say like uh, DRAS providers, DR as a service, there is a kind of expertise that comes in business continuity disaster recovery planning that most organizations don't have on staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having that depth of expertise there, I think is, is, is huge for that. All right, so we've got about two minutes left. I do wanna give you the last word, but before we do that, I wanna look at the map one more time. Looks like uh, Pakistan is in the house, which is awesome. Uh, Malaysia, uh, Dubai, so the Middle East really weighing in um, uh, across the board in India. So that's fantastic. Uh, Czech Republic, I don't know who it is from Czech Republic, but I don't think they ever miss. Um, so thank you for joining that. Uh, um, oh, we're back in the US. Looks like uh, Jersey's in the house. Uh, I think that's Utah um, also is there. Uh, along the way. So uh, so please keep the countries coming. We will try to, to reply back to these overall. And, and thank you for everyone who joined for today. Um, do you want to give you a couple teases coming up? So uh, typically on Mondays, we also tell you about the great stuff coming on Friday of that week. It's no longer coming on Friday because our friends in Europe said, that's the end of my day. It's after five o'clock. I don't want to be on a webcast at five o'clock on Friday. And we get that. So now our Friday calls are actually now going to be Thursday live streams. So we're going to keep doing the industry insights on Mondays. And then our um, our technology centric ones are now going to be on Thursdays, still at that noon East Coast time. Uh, this week, um, our friends Rick Vanover and Melissa Palmer are going to be going through uh, continuous data protection. We're going to look at the CDP functionality in V11. Um, and so... Uh, Truly, there is some elegance in the design and some really powerful outcomes that come out of that. So if, you, if you've been looking uh, or needing um, uh, continuous data protection um, and you don't want to do storage asynchronous and synchronous, and you know there's that other little company that keeps trying to do CDP and uh, people have been waiting for Veeam to do it, it's here. It's in V11. You should go check that out. So make sure to do that on Thursday. And then also um, uh, Veeam 1. Uh, we are less than 30 days away from our annual user conference. We've got a whole bunch of breakout sessions, um, a lot of learnings and sharings to do. So uh, so please be on the lookout for registering for that. And we'll actually be highlighting that in um, a couple of the podcasts coming up over the next month. Uh, but Dustin, I, I am giving you that final word. Um, you're, uh, uh, imagine, imagine that we are back in user conferences. This is the, the last 30 seconds. You've got a room full of IT decision makers. They're thinking about the cloud. They're tinkering with the cloud. They need better data protection. If you could just shake their shoulders and say, this is what you need to know. What do they need to know? You need to, first of all, you need to know that Veeam has a product for that, right? <laughs> so, all right. Again, all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have we have a product for that. It's free to try. There's they're, they're in each major clouds in the marketplace. Uh, give it a shot. Give it a you know try it out. There's no cost. It's it's free to protect up to ten instances. Um, check it out. You know, you know we one of the one of the major things for I'll say for a, a IO or you know C C level is that the uh, our policies you can see a cost of of, of to run a policy uh, before you even run it. So check it out. Uh, look at that and give it a go.
Sounds good. All right, big hands on the six, and I promise we'd end on time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this week. We'll continue to uh, to uh, to answer that. It looks like we have one last question that just came in from uh, Boniface on, do you guys have some courses? Yes, yeah, so we do have some uh, courses, and our core flagship product has courses around how to use clouds here in Cloud Connect. Um, and then do we have online courses yet for the, for the Azure and Amazon native products? I think we do, don't we? Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, we for the should, yeah, they're internally as well. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Keep the questions coming. We will answer them in chats and uh, check the Thursday session and we'll see you next Monday. Bye bye.